Today's video is sponsored by Squarespace. So today we're gonna do a good old Q&A video. It's been a while since I've done one of these. And I put out a call for questions recently on my Instagram, got a lot of very interesting submissions from people. So today we're gonna talk about things like Hasselblad versus GFX, old CCD digital medium format cameras, underrated film stocks, how to deal with the grayness of the UK, finding locations, the threat of AI, how to stay inspired, when to share new work, and a whole bunch more. And let's just jump right into it. So we're gonna start off some good old gear talk. And the first one is something that I was asked the most out of all the questions. And this is all about Hasselblad or GFX. So I had what's with the Hasselblad I've been shooting with? Am I thinking about moving from the GFX? How does the Hasselblad compare to the GFX? Fuji GFX or Hasselblad, lots of interest around this kind of stuff. So uh, the reason I was shooting with the Hasselblad recently is because I was working on a CFE 100C review, which I posted up a couple weeks back. Uh, so that camera's gone back, now I had it for a couple months, but I personally am not switching to a Hasselblad system. Uh, the reason for that is because I'm happy with the GFX and I also couldn't justify the cost of the Hasselblad systems, but when it comes to either one from like a capability standpoint, you take a Hasselblad X2D, you take a GFX 100S2 or 100S, and neither camera is gonna hold you back and neither camera, once you learn how to use them, is going to make your images any better or worse. Um, there just are things between the systems that might be appealing to you know, specific people. So I will say the Hasselblads are like a little bit more refined feel a little bit nicer from like a build standpoint. And then there's something like the CFV, which is obviously from like an experience standpoint, lets you shoot with an old film camera and brings that element to it. So that is pretty cool. But the GFX, specifically uh, the 100S, which is what I have now, you know, the big thing with this for me is just the price of it, especially on the used market. The 100S uh, is like a five or 600 pounds more than a 50S2 right now. So this is you know pretty affordable for what it is compared to what it costs when it was new. And then also you know the glass, the GFX glass compared to the Hasselblad glass is also, depending on the lens, much more affordable. This 35 to 70 that I use for a lot of my work is like four or 500 pounds and it's really, really good. So that's a big reason for me why I've chose to go with the, the GFX. Um, obviously the 100 megapixel, Pixel cameras use the same sensor. I will say, and I've said this in the Hasselblad reviews I've done, I really like their color. They have like the natural color solution and it gives you like this nice accurate base, especially in like weird and, and mixed lighting scenarios. So to edit from, it's a really nice starting point. But obviously you have the film profiles with the Fuji and I think with like with any camera system you buy nowadays, if you take the time to learn it, um, you're gonna understand how to work with it best. And I don't think like I think if you took both those cameras, spent the time to, to learn them, at the end of the day, your images are gonna look fairly similar. Okay, next up is another Hasselblad question, but this time it's about this system right here, this Hasselblad H series. So I had a question, tell us about the digital Hasselblad H you've been using, do you like it? So I have worked with this in a couple of videos now. I've never talked about it yet, just because um, I haven't really felt the need to. You know, a lot of these like on location videos I've been shooting, I've just wanted to focus on like the project and the experience and I don't really feel like, you know, being like the 39 megapixels on this is blah, blah, blah. But um, I will talk about it eventually. The reason that I've been shooting with this um, for the World War II project, the RAF stuff I'm doing, I'm pretty sure that is gonna be done on digital now, mostly from like a convenience standpoint. It's allowing me to work a little bit quicker. So I have the GFX, but I've always been interested in these older H series. Uh, a big thing is the optical viewfinder. It's so nice on these cameras. The EVFs uh, across a lot of cameras nowadays, I love from a practicality standpoint, but I absolutely hate from an experience standpoint. So that's a big selling feature for me with this. Um, and then another thing is just the sensor on this camera. So this is an H3D2. 39, so it's 39 megapixels. Let me see if I can get this off without dropping it. And this is like a 2008 camera, so old tech, but it's a 645 Kodak CCD sensor. This is a 1.1 crop, so this is just about the same size as 645 film, so quite a bit bigger than the crop sensor in the GFX. 
And there's just, there's an appeal or an interest to me with that. I mean, at the end of the day, it's not gonna make the images better or worse, but I'll just be honest, I'm a sucker for things like this at times, and it's made me, like, piqued my interest enough to wanna buy into this system, work with the two, kind of compare them, and then make a decision. So, yeah, I'll post results about that whenever I decide between either one. Okay, next up, what is a film stock that you think is underappreciated? So this is kind of a tough one to answer because there aren't a lot of film stocks available. Like when we're talking about say color negative or something. So I think the ones we do have are fairly well appreciated, but I wanna say if I had my choice, it would be Kodak Gold 120. And obviously, you know, Portra is super popular, but this one, not just for the price, I mean, this is really affordable compared to Portra. Right now in the UK, you can get a pro pack of this for almost like a little over 30 pounds, which is amazing. You know, we've all been talking about how expensive shooting with film's getting, and then we get a brand new film from Kodak last year that's actually pretty affordable. I, I think at BH Photo in the States right now, it's like $32. So uh, that's a huge selling feature for me, but also I've just been shooting a lot more of this recently and price aside, I've actually almost preferred the look of it uh, for whatever reason. I found it just develops and scans and converts really nice. Um, you know, no strange cast, just like a pretty clean look right out of scan conversion. So goal 200, that's gotta be my choice. All right, last one for the gear section. What would you say is the most accessible way to start medium format photography? So from like a, a cost, standpoint, um, I would say a TLR has got to be the way to go for anyone who wants to try out medium format film, just because it gives you a six by six negative, which is a really, you know, big step up from 35. There's a lot of TLRs out there from like well-known brands, Minolta, Yashica, Rolly Cords, that are all like fairly similar in price, fairly affordable and all like, um, you know, similar in terms of their capability. Like you could grab a rolly cord in good condition and go and shoot an entire project on it and it's gonna be able to do the job. And then there's just like a simplicity to them. There's a lot less that can go wrong. You aren't buying into like, you know, a 1980s electronic Bronica or, or 90s or whatever. So yeah, I think there's like a simplicity that comes with them um, that also could help you avoid, potentially avoid buying a, a camera that's just gonna give you problems. So TLR would be my choice and then Pick up some gold, it's a good way to get started. All right, so I just gotta take a quick break here in the video to talk about the sponsor of the video today, which is Squarespace. So I've been using Squarespace for a number of years now for my portfolio, but I recently decided to do a complete website refresh, and I've always really loved the templates that they offer. They're nice and clean and professional, but this time I decided to try out a new custom builder that they launched called Blueprint, which made it so incredibly easy to get the exact look I was after. So Blueprint allows you to build your site from scratch, but it provides you with layout options, color palettes, and font pairings. And then it also gives you control over everything, allowing you to easily do things like change gallery styles, image sizes, add thumbnails, drop in new content blocks, or add professional features for your business like an online shop to sell your work. So check out squarespace.com today, sign up for a free trial, test it out, and if you're happy with it, you can use my link below to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Okay, back into the Q&A. Okay, so moving on, we're gonna jump into some uh, questions about production and making work. So first one is, how do you juggle between shooting photos and videos? I find either one is very time consuming. This has been something that has been a, a, a huge learning curve for me just because obviously when you go out, when I'm say making videos for YouTube, as soon as you work in video and having to kind of document the experience, it changes the image making process because your mind is also uh, focused on something else. So it's not the same as just going out by yourself and being fully immersed in the experience, unfortunately. And I think it does uh, and, or can affect the work because again, you aren't as kind of immersed in, in the image making process. So for me, it's been all about uh, trying to have as like clear of a plan as possible or structure when I go out. Uh, what's helped me is that I spent the first like seven years of my career shooting television, outdoor action sports as like a solo operator and director. So I often had to go out into these environments and you know shoot an entire TV show uh, with what I had. So I think I built up this like 
muscle memory of things I need to do and this habit of like understanding I need to capture establishing shots and B-roll and you know, this type of on cam and this over here. So that's helped, but even just going out, not with a script, but like a structure. So if I go out for like an on location video, I'll just even write in, in like notes, I need to capture an intro and then I need to capture these kind of four points where I'll talk about the camera, uh, creativity or like whatever it is just so I'm not going out and winging it and hoping I come back with it, something that'll make a video, um, going out with like a, a, a structure that I can follow and feel good that when I get back, I have everything I'm gonna need. Okay, so next up, this is a good one. I'm frustrated watching USA YouTubers with good light. How do you manage the gray UK? Um, this is something that took me a little bit of time to adjust to just because I'd built up the, the uh, habit of shooting in the American West for my last work. But I think a big thing is just, it's really important to embrace the place that you're trying to capture and not make it something that it isn't. So the UK often is gray and raining and overcast. And I think trying to force it so you're only capturing it in like perfect conditions is essentially trying to make it into something it's not. Um, this book right here is one of my favorites, A1 The Great Road North by Paul Graham. He has an amazing little um, blurb here in his essay at the back where he's speaking about making this work. And he says, uh, Britain is not blessed with blue skies and daily sunshine, yet the soft light has its unique qualities and tonality that one should respect. The famous English weather and its rain cycle created the land we pass through, the green fields, soft hills, streams, and verdant hedgerows, and to some degree shape the lives we live away from the elements for the most part. And I absolutely love that. And when I read that, it really made me kind of uh, understand the importance of, yeah, capturing a place for what it is. You know, the way this landscape looks is largely due to the grayness and the weather as Paul Graham states there. So I think just accepting that can then allow you to go and start making work and not you know, wish you were somewhere else or wish it, it looked a different way. And I think as the more you do that, the more you'll start to understand how to work with it best. Next up is how do you find your locations to shoot at? So uh, an example I'll use for this is uh, the last trip I went on, which was this huge road trip across the UK, uh, shooting that Hasselblad video. I went up the Welsh coast and then over to the East coast. And a big thing for me is Google Maps. So for that trip, I was focusing on documenting old like garages and petrol stations. So I'd, I'll go on Google Maps and I'll just like zoom in on like a very rural area and I'll type in garage and I'll see what pops up and then I'll use street view. And the goal for me really is to give myself these like uh, points on a map, like a route to follow with some potential locations. And then I'll leave the rest open to chance. So on that one, I think I had like eight or nine locations that gave me kind of this path to follow. And then just would like, you know, go off on side roads as, a, as I was kind of driving through. And the, my favorite places from that trip were just like by chance along the way as well. So I'll plug those into like a planning program. I use Milano right now. And uh, yeah, that just maps out a rough route to follow. And then yeah, leave it open. Half the fun is honestly just like seeing what you find along the way. Okay, and last one for this, uh, this is an AI question and I almost didn't uh, answer this one just because honestly, like AI is not something that I have paid that much attention to. Like I understand what's out there and I've kind of seen where it's going. But uh, one of the things is uh, for what I'm doing, like focused on, you know, creating long-term photo projects and, and doing a YouTube channel and kind of building this business around uh, the images I'm making and also like my journey and, and teaching and sharing all of this. I don't think AI is a, as big of a threat for that type of stuff because it's not just about the images. You know, AI can go and make these images, but a lot of it is also about the artist and the person. You know, when you when you are interested in someone's work, you're also interested in them and their journey and what they're doing and all of these other aspects to it. So I don't think there's as big of a threat uh, if you're doing that type of work. But when I think about like commercial work, when I used to run a video production company and I was doing commercial work, like for example, now there's this Sora, which I think is by OpenAI, where they, I just saw some video the other day where it was like, uh, you know, in Japan with like, uh, 
flower petals flying through the air and two women walking or something like it looked so good and this is at its infancy when it's going to look kind of it's worse it's only going to get better and that does give me some concern for what that will do to like commercial production work at some point in the future like i think about a business are they going to go out and hire a production crew for you know tens of thousands of dollars to make them a 30 second video of like two people in a house enjoying their new house they purchased or are they just going to use one of these programs to make that for them so it does it's i think it's going to have an effect for sure on the commercial world um which yeah it's concerning but i mean it's not going anywhere so uh yeah i don't really know what else to say about that but that's kind of my thoughts on it i, I don't think it's going away and i certainly think it's going to impact uh, like a large portion of uh, not only the photography industry but other industries as well all right so next up is just some questions about projects and creativity so the first one here is from my buddy Jeff. He asks, how do you decide what to share and when to share new work, be it a full series or a new idea? So this may be different for me just because nowadays, you know, I'm doing this YouTube channel, I'm sharing everything, <laughs> partly because that's part of what my channel's about is, you know, creating content about photography. I'm not like a traditional review channel where I'm just doing camera reviews and stuff. So I'm also, always looking for things that I can share and talk about and teach and, and whatnot. And a big part of that has become what I'm working on and the things I'm learning and the things I'm discovering and the projects I'm working on, um, which has been challenging because it is a very different dynamic than just going and making work and not talking about it and eventually releasing it. But it's also been rewarding because it is nice to be able to share this stuff and then have people tell me that it's like maybe encourage them to go and, and, and start something they've wanted to start, which I think is cool. You know, I, that happens to me all the time when I see other photographers work as well. Um, so for me, I've been sharing everything like projects in their infancy, new ideas I'm having. I'm basically talking about it all and it's been an adjustment for me. But I don't think there's a right or wrong way. I think it's all what works best for you. And I don't think either approach is going to um, like harm the final result. For example, my work in American Mile, I shared that for like the whole few years I was making it. And then when I released the book, people were still interested and it sold fine. So um, there was no like impact of me sharing that work over the years. So it, I think it just comes down to the person and, and really what you feel most comfortable with. Okay, next one is shoot first, then find a concept or concept and then shoot. And at least in my experience, I think a, such an important part and necessary part is getting out there and putting yourself out in the environment and making work. And that at least for me has been the only way to eventually come across that one thing that kind of sparks the idea or gives you clarity. I think you can like, do research and, and come up with rough ideas and be inspired at home, but I think you have to get out there and spend some time um, pursuing these rough ideas before you can like dial and lock something in. That's how it was for me with an American Mile. Same with uh, Slate City. You know, I was going up to Wales for like a year before I like came up with an idea of what to do or, or started to understand it better. Same with this World War II stuff. So uh, for me, it's always been uh, shoot, then develop concept. Um, I don't think you can purely just sit at home, say in an office and be like, this is what I'll do, this is how it's gonna look and then go and start doing it. So this is an interesting one that I was sent kind of last minute. It's, if you have an idea for a photo project that you feel is really good and unique, should you put it out there before it's finished or be secretive and protective about it? And this is similar to that first question, but it's the secretive and protective part I wanted to touch on because when it comes to photo projects, you know, we're all going to pursue and approach things differently, even if it's like a similar idea on paper. But not only that, I think, you know, to commit to a photo project and stick with it and see it through, like it has to be something that you're like absorbs you completely and that you're really, really passionate about. So if you if you're worried about putting an idea out there because someone's going to steal it, the chances of that happening, I think, are so slim because you know, that person would have to, maybe they see what you're doing and they like it, but it really would have to speak to them and connect with them for them to be able to go and take that and see it through to its end. And then not only that, but 
you could both do the same thing and it would probably end up looking very different. So I think what's most important is just like getting excited about whatever idea you have and just going and making the work and enjoying yourself and try to avoid as much as these, these like little things as possible where we get in our heads about like, should I talk about it or is this person gonna like it or what are people gonna think about it or is someone gonna see it? Like all that I think is just resistance and unnecessary complications we put in our head to kind of avoid doing the work at first. So I think you just gotta get out there, pursue something, have fun and, and see where it goes. Okay, so two more here and we're gonna finish this off. The first one is advice for the uninspired photographer. Someone also asked, how do you keep the motivation to keep shooting? So first off, if you're uninspired, I think you have to really look at what is causing that lack of inspiration because uh, that's something I've experienced, you know, over and over and over and over again throughout my career. And it's only until recently that I've started to understand why those periods of uh, like a lack of inspiration happen. And it could be things like, you know, maybe you've been shooting the same thing for six or seven years and you're just bored of it now, but you've put yourself in a box and you're trying to, you know, keep doing it. Or, or you know, maybe you're putting work out there that you're excited about and it's not being well received on something like social media and that's changing your relationship with it. So just being really honest with yourself about what could potentially be causing that. But also when it comes to like staying motivated, something that I have found has really helped me um, over the last like year and a half is having multiple things to work on. So in the past I was like, this is what I'm working on, this one thing, and until it's done, that's all I'm focused on. And what would happen is you're inevitably gonna get to points with like a project or a focus where you're like tired for a bit, and then you might take a month off, which is fine. But for me, having multiple projects has really given me this uh, like opportunity to be like, oh, well, I, you know, I'm a little bit just burnt out of working on my Slate City project, but now I'm feeling really excited to go and do something completely different with the World War II stuff, or, you know, I focused a little bit recently on petrol stations across the UK. So it's been like the first time I've ever approached multiple things, but I found it's been really helpful to keep me like enthusiastic and uh, give me something to go out and focus on. Uh, and feel excited about. So there's been less of those dips as I give myself different things to work on. Okay, and the last one here, so this is uh, an interesting one as well, and I thought it'd be good to close on. So what would you say is the most overrated skill in photography and the most underrated? So when I say uh, overrated, I certainly don't mean this is like not important, it's very important, but I think the most overrated skill is just like, um, a technical ability and a creative ability. So actually being able to like execute to make a good image. I think it's very important for sure, but it's something that you will eventually develop over time if you stick with it. So I don't think that's the thing that's gonna hold people back more than what I think is underrated, which is just like commitment and dedication and discomfort and kind of perseverance. And that sounds maybe like a little bit dramatic for a creative pursuit, but I think, or what I've learned at least over doing this for a really long time now, is there's gonna be so many things that constantly pop up in terms of like your work not being well received or something falling through or a deal falling through or people being critical of your work or worrying what other people are saying. Like there's, we're constantly finding all of these things, these reasons why we shouldn't take action or these reasons why we aren't good enough or imposter syndrome, all of these things that I've seen hold so many people back because they just either don't take action or it takes them months to go and do things. And what I've learned at least is none of that stuff goes away. And what's most important is just to constantly put yourself out there, try and stay focused on whatever your interest and your goal is and to just accept those things and keep pushing through them. Like don't let them hold you back and slow you down because often I've seen really talented people who just haven't gone and done the thing that they've wanted to do and they've talked about it for months and months and months and years and it's not a lack of skill holding them back, it's a lack of just um, like commitment and perseverance and you know ability or, or, or maybe not ability but uh, accepting discomfort. So yeah, the more uncomfortable you can get just throw yourself out there into the arena, as they say. I really, truly think that is when you'll start to make the most progress with your work. Anyways, that wraps this one up. I hope this was interesting. I'm always like conscious of time and going way too long with this stuff. 
this one already looks like it's gonna be pretty long. But anyways, I hope you enjoyed this one and uh, hit me up on Instagram. I'll do another one of these at some point if people enjoy it and uh, always open to questions. I'll put my Instagram handle down at the bottom. But thank you for watching. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions and uh, I'll talk to you soon.